Today we'll be learning about the urinary system. So not only when the blood comes into this system, like it does all our systems, every organ receives oxygenated blood, uh, not only is it going to release oxygen, but also uh, your kidneys are going to filter uh, the blood. So during all your systems in different uh, reactions, there is a certain toxic material that's produced, and your kidneys will actually eliminate that from your body. Every day, you filter around 200 liters of fluid from your bloodstream, so this happens very often. Um, so, like I was saying before, cells produce waste that can become toxic if they accumulate. Um, the reason why we age, essentially, is because all of these reactions, like cellular respiration, for instance, produces waste. Um, whenever your body takes a nucleic acid and breaks it down in, in, into nucleotides, or you take proteins during digestion, um, and pepsin breaks it down, helps to break it down and makes um, amino acids, there are byproducts that are produced that are toxic for you. Um, you age, but as long as you keep eliminating them, you won't, you, it will um, make aging um, not happen so fast. So the functions, the urinary system removes salts and nitrogenous waste. Um, it maintains a normal concentration of a water and electrolytes, so just making sure that it's only eliminating what's needed in order to maintain a healthy um, concentration of water in the system. And it also maintains your pH, controls your red blood cell production and blood pressure. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the composition. In other words, you were going to focus on the anatomy. So of course you have two pairs of kidneys. They're in the back of your body. So um, if you ever have uh, back pain, sometimes that can be a signal of um, kidneys or a kidney stone or something like that. Um, so from the kidneys to the bladder, you have your readers. So they will actually transport the, the urine. So in the kidneys, that's where all the filtration occurs. Once it's in the ureters, that means that, with, that it is urine. Um, it is stored in the urinary bladder until it gets too full, and then the urethra will convey urine to the outside of the body. So um, this diagram here is a very simple diagram um, and for you to label. You have your kidneys, your readers, which lead to the bladder. Um, that is a sphincter. It will hold the fluid in, and urethra will actually lead it out of the body or convey it as it says in the notes. Um, so kidneys, I kind of already said this, but they lie on either side of your vertebral column, in other words, in the either side of your spine. Um, if you, as you see in this picture, all the organs have been removed and that's why you can see them. Um, otherwise, they'd be hidden by your digestive organs. Kidneys sit in a depression called the renal, renal sinus. You'll actually see this when you remove the kidneys from the rabbit that it leaves a depression called a sinus. Um, so, on top of each of your kidneys, you, it starts with the renal capsule. I always kind of remember this because a capsule, like on top of a pill, is the outside part of a pill. It encloses each kidney and gives it a glistening appearance. You'll definitely see a glistening appearance inside of the rabbit. Um, on t uh, as well as just a renal capsule, there's actually some fat in that region. Um, the fatty mass around each kidney can help hold it in place. Um, if you have any rapid weight loss, your kidneys will actually lower in position and it causes a um, disease called ptosis. Um, so like if someone has an eating disorder, for instance, or may have um, lost a lot of weight due to a disease, it will cause this other um, disease to occur and it basically will sort of kink your ureters. Um, your adrenal gland um, does not have much to do with um, the urinary system, but it is there still. So it's a top each of your kidneys and is a part of the endocrine system. It's a separate organ function. So just as a blast of the past, you're going to answer the question, what hormone does the adrenal gland release and what major autonomic nervous system branch does it contribute to? So I kind of told you the answer here, but um, hopefully you can explain it better. Okay, so the kidney anatomy. So we're gonna look more into our kidney anatomy. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is our renal cortex. So um, I will show you a picture of this in a second. So for now, just kind of write these in and I'll explain it with a picture. So your outer shell um, around the medulla, the cortex appears granulated due to the presence of the nephron. So the nephron is the functioning part of the kidney and that is what you see there. 
um, the renal medulla, medulla is the center part of your kidney. So we kind of we started um, a little bit more superficial, and now we're deep center of the kidney that contain these pyramids. The pyramids will have these triangul triangular shapes and regions. They're striped and due to um, a whole bunch of tubules and capillaries that are like tangled in there. You have the renal pelvis, the superior end of the kidneys, and forms a funnel-shaped sac. And then you have the calyx is major and minor, and it's basically the location urine passes before the ureter. The major is larger and the minor is smaller. I do have a diagram um, in a quizlet for you to practice this. Um, so of course, we need to filter the blood. So we're gonna talk about the structure. So you have your artery and you have your vein. So this will be coming from the lungs, the heart would pump it um, to your kidney. Um, the blood would go to your nephron to be filtered, which is the functioning part of this. There are t millions of them in here. And then it would it would not only um, deoxygenate, but also be filtered and come back as a venule and a vein and go back to the, um, eventually to the vena cavus. So again, your artery is attached to the abdominal aorta. So that's where this would have came from. Um, veins attached to the inferior vena cava. Um, you have interlober um, arteries that pass between the renal pyramids. So that would be like all of these arteries that are kind of in between your pyramids here and your afferent which is right here afferent arterioles lead to the nephron so um, if as you remember you have arterioles with the artery to the arterioles this is also your venule um, so this would be your um, efferent venule that would come from the nephrons so now you have your kidney and we're going to go over what I just went over so you have the renal capsule that's the outside of your kidney um, you have the most superficial portion, which is your renal cortex. Uh, this is where all of your nephrons would be. Um, the renal medulla, which would contain your renal pyramids. This is where a lot of the blood, as you can see, is. You have your minor calyx and the major calyx, which is here. Okay, so the minor and the major calyx. You have your arteries and veins and your ureter, which would lead to the bladder. So once um, the fluid is in here, this would be like the filter, that this would be what was filtered from the blood. So this would be like the urine. So now we're gonna talk about the functioning part of a kidney, which is called your nephron. So when you zoom in here, um, you're going to see that the functioning part is called a nephron. And we're gonna learn the structures of the nephron sorry about that you're going to learn this the structures of the nephron um, and also what that function is um, so again the nephron is the functioning unit of the urinary system so I just thought this would be fun um, a nephron is the urinary system as blank as to the nervous system so what is the major functioning part of the nervous system um, so if you thought about it a little bit uh, please pause it just to think um, but you're just trying to think like what is the major cell um, and functioning part of the nervous system you'll answer that in the ed puzzle um, so each kidney came to, contains about one million nephrons um, you have the renal carpusal it's composed of a tangled cluster called a glomerulus which filters the fluid so here we have our nephron and you will be labeling this i have it also in the quilts lit so you'll be able to practice this many many times um, so this is where filtration occurs. It's called the glomerulus. That's where your artery would come in. Um, around here, so that basically what we there would be all kinds of capillaries around this. So you would see like purple because it's where it would now be like it would be um, deoxygenating all through on top of it. And I'll show you a picture of that um, in class uh, tomorrow. Um, but uh, it's just been taken off so we can see the nephron. So we have the Bauman's capsule. Um, part of the Bauman's capsule has been removed so you can see the glomerulus, but normally um, it would be covering it completely, kind of like a baseball mitt would be, or softball mitt, would be covering a ball. So it should be covering that region, the glomerulus, a lot because um, you don't want this structure to be damaged because otherwise it would filter too much. You have the proximal tubule. Proximal means close. It's the tubule that is closest to the glomerulus. Um, this is called the loop of Henley or the nephron loop. It's a loop, so it actually has a loop in the name. Um, and essentially, the, you would just have the urine passing through all of this. You have the distal tubule here. Okay, so the distal tubule is the tube that is furthest from the 
um, glomerulus. And then you have the collecting tubule. So basically here you just have the urine collecting. And then now everything, now your urine would be formed because all the filtration and reabsorption would have occurred, which we'll talk about more in a second, and it would carry to the ureter. So um, the pathway of urine, so this glomerulus to the proximal tubule, to the nephron loop, to the distal tubule, to the collecting duct, ureter, and then the bladder. So that's just the pathway in which it would go. Um, so um, blood vessels entering the glomerulus, you can kind of see the blood coming in here, and that actually that's where major filtration occurs, um, which we'll talk about more in a second. Um, and again, like I really love this picture. You're going to be taking this picture and adding things to it um, at one point, I think on Wednesday. Um, but you can kind of see that the blood cell coming in, the um, sorry, blood vessel coming in, um, being filtered. So it filters your salts, uh, water, urea, uric acid, glucose, things like that here. Um, and then um, you would have your your artery going through water and glucose, amino acids, and salts um, would be. Um, reabsorbed, which I'll talk about more about that in a second. So everything that was like absorbed here would actually go back into the blood vessel here because too much gets absorbed um, into this region. Um, and then um, it would be like the last ditch effort to get any other ions, drugs, ammonia, things like that would go in the distal tubule. And then now urine um, would be collecting in this region. Okay, so now we're going to get into urine formation. So we are in the nephron still, and there are three processes that occur before urine can be formed. So we're going to talk about the process in which um, urine formation occurs. The three processes, we'll start with filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. So it kind of starts off like filter anything passively, um, reabsorb things back to the blood, because you want to make sure that your blood contains the amount of nutrients needed for your body, so it took too much in the beginning, now reabsorb it back in. And then kind of like the secretion at the end is like last ditch effort, get rid of any kind of toxins that may be in the blood system, so like your hormones, um, drugs, pills, things that you may be on will also be, that's where that will be secreted. All right, so we are going to start off in the glomerulus. So filtration occurs in the glomerulus um, where the Bauman's capsule is. Um, so let's start there. So the glomerulus acts as a filter. Uh, passively filters water, solutes smaller than proteins, urea, uric acid are forced through capillary walls and pores of the glomerulus. So I know it says like passively and forced in the same sentence and that's a little counteractive, but um, passively just saying um, that there is no active transport, no ATP needed. The reason why I say it's kind of forced um, is because just like the pressure from the uh, blood coming in just causes it to move into that region. Blood cells and proteins are too large to pass through the filtration membrane. So you should not be seeing blood in your urine. You should not be seeing proteins um, in the urine. And if so, that could be a sign of damage to that glomerulus, um, which I just gave you the answer to the next one. So if blood is found in the urine, what structure is most likely damaged? Um, these we haven't really talked about yet. Um, and glomerulus is the way it actually filters. So there must be something wrong with the filtration process. So now that things have been re have been absorbed, so urea, uric acid, certain ions, anything pretty much small enough to get into the nephron is out of the blood. But unfortunately, it's too much. So something's going to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, so that way that we you still have all the nutrients needed to be able to uh, pass in the body. So during filtration, many many useful substances such as water glucose, amino acids, and ions are removed from the blood. So now what's going to happen is all those structures I just talked about, water, glucose, amino acids, ions are going to go back into the bloodstream. As the filtered blood passes the proximal tubule, these molecules are returned um, by osmosis, so that's obviously your water, um, and active transport. So this is, um, and we'll talk more in a minute about um, hormonal control, but this is where that would occur. Tubular secretion. So now we're all the way to the distal tubule. So we were at the proximal tubule, now we're all the way to the distal tubule. The um, loop of Henle is just the place where a lot of the capillaries are and uh, deoxygenation is continuing. So substances such as hydrogen, potassium, cretinine drugs are uh, moved from the blood to be eliminated in the urine. It's like the, the nephron's last ditch effort to get anything out of the urine or out of the bloodstream that shouldn't be in there. Uh, urine is now formed, so it is now called urine, um, and the blood is now quote unquote clean. 
Um, this all occurs in the distal tubule. Um, I know it says urea here. Um, some urea will, um, if it was any that was left in the blood, will continue to move in here. Okay, so um, urine composition. So what is our urine made of? Um, mostly water. 95% is water. Um, urea, so you probably heard me say that a couple times, like what is that? So that's actually formed by the liver as an end product um, after protein is broken down. So uh, when amino acids are used to produce energy, it may contain traces of amino acids. So that's just basically a um, anytime your body is breaking down proteins or um, your body's using proteins in a way that it's broken down, so you're taking the protein, breaking the bonds to make your amino acids, so the polypeptide bonds are being broken, um, urea is um, is being produced, which is toxic and you got to get rid of it. Uric acid is when nucleic acids are metabolized. So anytime you are metabolizing nucleic acid, uric acid is produced. Urine, that's where the name comes from because urea and uric acid are in that structure or in that uh, fluid. Cretinine is metabolized in muscle tissue. So anytime your muscles are working, it creates uh, cretinine. Um, urine may also contain other chemicals um, such as hormones um, or drugs. Um, these things can also be detected in that region. Urine elimination. After urine forms in the nephrons, the ureters carry the urine away towards the bladder. Uh, your bladder is expandable structure that stores urine before it is eliminated from the body. Transitional epithelial cells change shape to allow for expansion and contraction. So it will be larger if um, there's a lot of fluid or it'll get smaller if it's not. So it's like it just it's just a structure that can uh, get larger or smaller. Um, this is actually a lab grown. I thought this was kind of cool. It's an artificial bladder um, grown in a lab. You can kind of see the size of it and what it looks like. Um, the name for urination is called micturation. Um, uh, the bladder fills, it's a reflex um, underneath voluntary control. The urethra would carry it away from the body and you have something called detrusor muscles um, and that's like would contr control urination. Okay, so now we need to talk about water homeostasis. How do we make sure that you have a correct amount of fluids in your body? So let's get started. So water concentration, 50% um, for women and 60% for men. Um, men have more of a concentration of water because they, due to testosterone, they have more muscle um, mass. Women have more fat than men due to um, reproduction. Um, it causes us just to have more fat um, concentration, so 50% to 60. Um, homeostasis, water and electrolytes, um, sodium, potassium, and cal calcium ions concentration is linked with kidney processing. Most water intake from fluid is most of the water that you take in is from food and fluids that are digested. A small amount is um, a end product of cellular respiration. So there's a thirst mechanism. Driving force of water intake is the increase in plasma solute concentration. Um, two to three excites thirst centers. So in other words, um, when you have a two to three percent increase in solute. Um, more than homeostasis, you're going to be you're going to become thirsty, um, and actually. The Sorry for the interruption. Okay, so ADH, um, which is a negative feedback mechanism, you may, you may remember ADH. We learned it um, during the endocrine system because it is a hormone. So um, horm it's the hormone that regulates the reabsorption of water and electrolytes by the kidneys. So this is all going to happen during reabsorption. Uh, when there is less water than solutes, the hypothalamus will send a signal to the pituitary gland. Um, and uh, the pituitary gland will secrete ADH, and it's released uh, to the bloodstream um, to prevent excess water loss in the urine. ADH will literally travel to the blood to the main target kidney collecting duct. So um, this will happen all the way down. So ADH will actually travel, and I kind of I think I said the wrong thing earlier. So make sure that you understand this. So the the ADH will actually travel all the way to the collecting duct, and that's where any water. So like let's say you have too much solute, the water will go back into your bloodstream. Okay, so that's what will occur there. And now what will happen is your urine will have that darker shade to it because at, that's that's kind of like a way that you can um, detect if you're dehydrated or not other than like having a headache or not feeling well is if you look at your urine, it'll be darker in color because in the collecting duct, your blood took out any other water because it's saying that your solutes are too high. When you're when your urine is more clear, 
um, and it doesn't have that really yellow tint to it, it's because the, the there wasn't any ADH and, or not a lot of ADH being released, so it's not reabsorbing water, so not a lot of water can remain in the urine. Um, this causes reabsorption for more water. Um, so here's a way, so like you're um, exercising and you're sweating a lot, so it's going to cause um, your um, water concentration in the system to be um, a little bit lower and not, your solute will be a little higher, right, because you're, you're sweating all the water out. Your hypothalamus will send a signal to the pituitary gland to secrete ADH. It will go to your kidneys, um, more specifically the collecting duct, and it will make it where it's an increase of water. And then that's where you may see your urine be a little darker because it has a higher solute concentration in the urine. So some disorders um, of the urinary system, many urinary problems can be solved by drinking enough water. So if you have kidney stones, you can drink water, even though there are some genetic um, things that can occur. So um, you want to make sure that you're drinking um, about three liters, about 13 cups of beverages a day. That means water, not soda um, or other things. You want to drink water um, in order to uh, maintain um, a healthy urinary system and body function system. So kidney stones um, occur due to calcium and oxalate buildup from the urine. Um, certain things that contain a lot of cal calcium or oxalate are like tea is a big one, black tea. Um, some um, Sometimes some people can be really sensitive to like kale or spinach. They can also increase um, that as well. There's other some, there's some other foods and things that do it also. Um, soda, I think, is a big one also that does it. Um, cystitis would be nothing that you're doing to yourself. You just got a bacteria. So the bacteria travel to your bladder or kidneys. Um, this is more common in women. This is a UTI, so a urinary tract infection, um, because right here, you're, for a female, our urethra is much shorter, right? Uh, males are longer because they have a penis, um, but for females, it's a lot shorter. So like um, the bacteria doesn't have very far to, um, to travel, and then it creates a UTI, urinary tract infection. Um, catheters, just so you know how catheters work, it's a tube, it's inserted into the body ca cavity, duct or vessel. Um, the process of inserting a catheter is called catheterization. Um, it's where you literally take a catheter and you insert it all the way up into the bladder region. Um, and therefore, when the when kidneys and everything works normally, but when the fluid's in here, it's just going to drain out into a bag. And so that way you don't urinate all over yourself. Um, you kind of see how that works here. So you just have like a tube in there and it'll just collect in here like a little bag and you can move it. Um, overactive bladder, this is something that happens to a lot of women. Um, sudden contractions of, or not women, everybody with age, but it's more common in women um, due to uh, labor and delivery because you have to push so hard to get the baby out. So your um, sphincter gets a little bit loosened and things like that. And so like you may laugh or sneeze or something and fluid will come out. Um, Incontinence is the ability to not to or inability to control urination. Um, Kegels um, is something that you can do for females to help um, strengthen those muscles. Um, kidney failure uh, may result to dialysis, uh, which will clean the blood. Um, some people need it four hours, three times a week. It's, a, it's probably a big bummer. Um, patients will eventually need a new kidney. But this is like a way, like a machine. Basically, it's a machine that does the filtering for you. So your blood will go in. It will filter everything like um, like what you're kind of, it would kind of do um, the process of your kidneys for you. And it would um, put the blood back in that would be filtered. Um, kidney transplant will, if we have time, we will watch one. It's kind of cool. And that's it. So um, hopefully you enjoyed the lecture. Um, and um, don't forget to answer the questions at the very end. And we're all done. We will definitely practice during the week. We'll split it up into different days, so don't, don't feel overwhelmed.